The uh, local women's uh, health symposium had invited a preacher to, um, to give them a talk. When uh, the minister's wife asked about the topic, he was too embarrassed to admit that he was asked to talk about sex. Thinking very quickly, he replied, I'm going to be talking about sailing. Oh, that's nice, the wife said. The next day at the grocery store, a young woman who had attended the lecture approached the minister's wife and said, that was certainly an excellent talk your husband gave. He's quite a, an expert and he has a unique perspective on the subject. Somewhat chagrin, the minister's wife replied, gee, funny that you should think so. I mean, he's only done it twice. The first time he threw up and the second time his hat uh, fell off. <laughs> Being too embarrassed to tell my wife that I was going to uh, speak about uh, gloom and doom again, uh, I told her that the uh, subject of my speech was going to be why one should buy junk bonds for one's retirement fund. <laughs> if you happen to see her tonight, please don't broach the subject. <laughs> okay, um, all kidding aside, it, it, it's all been said today and it's, it's hard for me now to speak after so many good speakers uh, and everybody already having said something about... Uh, the bubble economy and, and uh, unsustainable growth and unsustainable boom and um, um, the coming crash. I imagine that was also mentioned. So uh, even though I agree, um, it's hard to, to go over it again. So I, maybe I, I would like to sort of restrict my, some of my remarks to, uh, i make it in two parts, restrict some of my remarks to um, looking into the basic problem the, the, the very basic problem is not Mr. Greenspan, and, and it's not any of the central bankers of the world per se. It's the system. The fiat money system is highly, highly unstable. It's a system that will create over and over crisis. And you don't have to be a genius, um, but just look at the evidence. Last 30 years. You have had a crisis after a crisis after a crisis every single day, every single year practically. You go back to the late 60s, the inflation, the Vietnam inflation, the 70s, the tremendous inflation in the developed world, the, uh, the aftermath of, of, of parts of those inflations, the 74 credit deflation, which was an in incredible, incredible deflation, credit deflation, the 1982 credit deflation, um, the 1985, 86, 87 boomlet, followed by a crash, the 1987 crash. The 1988, 89 reflation that created a boom in real estate. And of course, the disaster that followed <clears throat> with the savings and loans collapse. And, and, and probably all the banks, or almost the ba most of the banks in Texas and Massachusetts. The, the billions and billions and billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars use taxpayers' money to, to clean up the mess. And that's not just the United States. In the mid-70s, the hyperinflation in, in, in Britain, when the IMF was called in, and the secondary banks all collapsed. All secondary banks collapsed in, in Britain. Um, the Latin America hyperinflation of the late 70s, early 80s, which literally destroyed the banking systems in Mexico and Argentina even Brazil at that time. The, the poverty that ensued after that, the, the tremendous loss of income, the, the indebtedness that followed after that. Um, the mid-80s in the Nordic countries, Sweden, Finland, Norway, 20% of their GDP has been used to pay to clean up that mess. Almost every single bank in those countries went under. Every single one, every single part of the world was affected in one way or another, by this kind of unstable monetary system, a fiat money system. And of course, the great bubble, the one that we all know, that we all follow every day, the Japanese uh, bubble of the, of the mid to late 80s, caused by, again, increases in money that were way above what the economy needed. Um, at the time, the Japanese central bank did not know that was creating a bubble. They admitted today they, don't, they didn't know it was creating a bubble. And, um, and we have... It's been 10 years since then, and we have not been able, to, or they have not been able to crawl out of it. So, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad history. It's a very sad history. And, and you may want to ask, why does that happen? Why is it that this, this can happen? I mean, we have intelligent central banks. 
they're an intelligent group of people. And, and they are intelligent. They all have degrees, and uh, some of them have PhDs, and uh, I have nothing, there's nothing wrong with PhD, but I mean, these people are intelligent. Why should central bankers be so wrong? Why do they cause these kind of things? The truth is that Ludwig von Mises already spoke about this phenomenon 70 years ago when he predicted that the, the socialist and communist economies would fail, would, would go under. And, uh, and uh, money is the same thing. You, you, in a centralized economy, uh, you try to control the amount of shoes and the amount of shirts and the amount of butter that the economy needs and is going to, to produce. And they never get it right. Never, never get it right. There's either millions of shoes in a warehouse and a shortage of butter, or, or tons of steel rot in some place, and, and they never get it right. There's always a shortage of something and a surplus of something else. Meaning, central authorities, no matter how intelligent they are, cannot create the right amount of anything. And why should it be any different with money? They are creating money, they're setting a rate, I mean, think about it. If, if there would be a gigantic marketing board in this country that would say, okay, we're going to decide on the amount of bananas that we're going to produce, and knowing uh, uh, people's taste and population increases and so on, and they would set a price, how many times do you think they would get it right? The answer is never. They will never get it right. And yet we have these philosophers, these banking philosophers, discuss, meet, eat our money uh, at these fancy uh, uh, places, I mean, talk in the press and, 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 and discuss quarter point increases and how many, how they can manipulate and fine tune a price, the price of money, which is the same thing as manipulating or fine tuning the price of bananas. They'll never get it right. And this is the reason why, this is the reason why fiat money systems don't work. But the evidence is staring us in the face and whereas in agriculture, we have given up marketing boards and we have given up price supports and just about everywhere we have given them up and the world has been able to produce food and feed the world um, without a problem. When it comes to money, we still persist with the same errors. A central bank that just manufactures money at its own will, thinking and estimating what the level should be and estimating what the, price, the correct price should be. It's, it's idiotic. It doesn't make any sense. So, uh, I, I don't think I've added very much to what was said before. I think maybe I said it in a, in a, in a in more layman's terms, but, but, but this is a serious problem. This is not just Greenspan, and it's not any other central bank, uh, or Duesenberg from the ECB, or any of these people, who, by the way, you'll note how many times these people appear in the press. They are continuously trying to talk a market. This, this verbal manipulation that goes on, it's incredible. I have to read this stuff every day, and it's unbelievable. Every single day, one guy says one thing, one central bank, and then another guy says something else, and another Federal Reserve official, and everything done to manipulate people's expectations. Now, you don't need that if you had a sound, healthy system. You wouldn't need that. So, having said that, I probably ended my talk, because... Um, the, the profiting from a fiat money system is a little bit too difficult. I left it to the end. I don't want to leave you with fallible forecasts and temporal truth. And uh, if, I, if I, I'm afraid to taint today's conclusions should my investment uh, recommendations or my investment advice prove wrong. So um, what I think I would like to do, um, and I, I want to make just one last point before I open it up for questions. I think that investment success today may have more to do with a subtle understanding of the political climate and the political will than with economic theory. I make that statement and, uh, and, um, and I say that, that um, political analysts with an understanding of Austrian economics will probably do better in these type of markets than economists and financial analysts like ourselves. And it's, it's, uh, it's a sad point, and it's, it's sad to say, and, and, um, and, and, uh, but I believe it, because every decision, and as we heard before, every decision that is made is a political decision, and there has to be a political will to bring the house of cards down and start again. If there isn't, 
we can ratchet upwards and continue to ratchet upwards with ever greater uh, degrees of vulnerability. We went from a Mexico crisis to an Asian crisis to a Russian crisis. Now think about it, a Russian crisis. Russia is a small player in the world. Less than 1% of GDP. I don't, I don't know what the numbers are. I mean, we don't know what the Russians produce or don't produce. Probably nothing. Maybe it's a negative GDP. But, but that Russia can actually create such havoc that the Fed had to lower rates 75 basis points, that the markets went into a frenzy, that you couldn't find bids that day or that month. It, it just tells you how sick the system is. We have created an a, a, a enormous, enormous, um, 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 we have created enormous leverage in the system, and that's all because the Fed has tampered with that variable that they don't know how to tamper with, because nobody really knows how to tamper with that variable. So having said that, um, I, I would like maybe to open the, the forum for questions, and maybe we can discuss, I don't know, investment ideas or anything like that. So yeah. Japan is undergoing a, 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 a deflation of assets and really a, a simultaneously a deleveraging. So we have this enormous credit that was created in, during the bubble and the credit was used to uh, inflate asset prices. And in, instead of allowing it to collapse all in one day, which they should have done that maybe 90, 91, uh, press the accelerator, you know, let the whole thing come down and, and close the banks and close all the banks that were no good, maybe 95% of them. They extended it, and they kept on providing some support all along. So they are deflating very slowly. The, the air is coming out very, very slowly. Asset prices have declined now for eight years in a row, if you talk about the, at least the, uh, real estate prices. And on the credit side, for instance, the banking system is liqui liquefying itself. Uh, if, if you notice the latest figures, let's say, for the past year, Bank loans are down about six or seven percent year over year. Now, as the banks are no longer lending, they now are pulling back, uh, consolidating, and buying governments. So their asset side is getting more liquid and more secure, and and, and they're writing off bad debt. Of course, with taxpayers' help, but but what's happening is that they're liquefying, and there's a credit def a credit deflation that's developing now. And a credit deflation of that sort if the central bank would not create new money, uh, chances are that you would get a, a real price deflation too, maybe 4 or 5% a year price deflation. The, the fact is that this, the Bank of Japan is sort of midway now. They're creating a certain amount of money. The monetary base is increasing around 4% a year. Uh, money supply, money supply is, is not increasing quite that fast. I think monetary base is increasing, sorry, 8% a year. Money supply is growing about 3 4% a year, which means there's still leakages in the system. Something similar to what happened to us in the 30s, where our, our monetary base was increasing, but money supply was decreasing because it wasn't sufficient. Okay? And um, so Japan is sort of playing a midway. The, the, the Central Bank of Japan, I think, has a trauma, a trauma of what, because of what happened in the 80s. At that time, in order to resist a rising yen, they monetized. That's what they did. They monetize, they, they, they un, they, what they did is they intervene and allow the intervention uh, to expand their money, their money supply and so created the bubble. So uh, the way I see it is the Bank of Japan is fighting very hard not to do that, not to do more than what they're doing. They're already doing enough. Um, I, would, I would, if I was in their shoes, of course, I would say don't do anything and don't increase the money supply, don't decrease it and let everything come down and liquidate it. But... Given the political situation, I think the Bank of Japan so far has, has done a, 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 a pretty good job, meaning they have inflated a little bit, allowing credit to, def, to, to liquidate, allowing asset prices to come down, and uh, the fiscal side is the one that has actually provided the support to the economy. Um, so in all, I would say that um, Japan is... is, is 
if I would grade it and, and A is tops and D is, is, is failing, I would say Japan is around a C plus to a B at the moment. The problem is that the, the brilliant economists all over the world are pouncing on the Bank of Japan and they're saying, why don't you uh, intervene now and create, uh, uh, allow, allow the intervention to inflate the money supply so you can get out of this, of this deflation. So that, that new cycle of inflation is, 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 uh, is not good. It's not good. And this is the problem why one can't trade it with a lot of confidence. And this is why I come back now to the question of politics. We're not trading economics. We know what the economics are. We know what the economic consequences of that are. But, but we don't know what the political system will do. Maybe they will, uh, maybe they will just reinflate and then, you know, you see the yen fall and inflation start. You know. Um, that's the, I, I think he can. I'll tell you where I think the, the Achilles heel is. I think he can, but there's a point at which he won't be able to, and that is probably at the point that inflation in prices accelerates. If, if inflation were to get over 3 or 4% a year, I think there would be a political will that develops to, to stop inflating. And then we'll start, uh, well, then we'll start the, the liquidating part of this cycle. Okay, so if LTCM appears again and inflation is 4% a year, probably at that point, if it's not 4, maybe 5% a year, probably at that point, the Fed will say, let it fall. So there, there's got to be a point at which, at which we can galvanize these politicians and, 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 uh, and stop the game. But so far, he's been extremely lucky. Um, all we have had is rising prices in stocks. Everybody likes it. There's nobody that wants lower prices. Um, and, and there's no cost to that. There's no apparent cost to that. We haven't seen yet an apparent cost. Right? Now, th your point on derivatives is... Uh, it, 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 derivatives is really a, a, another form of credit. And, and tampering with interest rates creates an explosion in credit. We have leveraged up the system in a phenomenal way. It's a phenomenal way. So derivatives is another side of that. Um, Murray, Murray, is, Murray was very extreme in, in, in that view that you can actually have non-counterfeit money. I think that Murray believed in 100% reserve backing, if I recall. Yes. Murray Rothbard, I assume. Murray Rothbard. Murray Rothbard was one of the great scholars in the Austrian movement. And uh, he, um, if, uh, am, am I right that he believed in 100% uh, reserve backing? Now that's, I, that's probably a little bit too extreme for the moment. It's probably too extreme. And I think maybe it will take another 75 years. But uh, it, it is possible to move away from central banking. That I believe. And, and the free banking is the alternative, is the real alternative. Free banking that's practiced by the Scottish banks in the 19th century is a very sound alternative. There's no central banks. And uh, it works well. It worked very well, too. So um, there are ways that we can get around or get away from discretion. The problem here is mon a human discretion. Uh, central bankers, no matter how good they are and how smart they are and how, how, many, how much their good intentions are, we still are going to have a problem of manipulation, of, of, of getting it wrong. So if you can get rid of central banking and there's ways to do it, um, and there was a tried way to do it. 19th century banking in, in Scotland was one of them. Um, that could be one alternative. I, I would love to see that. I'd love to see that. Yeah, so I don't know what to say. <laughs> Maybe if you lived long enough, you would have... No, 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 I didn't say that. Let me, let me correct I trade the economics and I don't do so well. That's the problem. I, I, what I said is that you've got to have a political sense better than an economic sense in some of these, in some of these things. Because you can, have the, you can have this economic scenario and I can have painted the same scenario back in 1992 or 93 when, when Greenspan lowered rates of 3%, which by, all, by everybody's admission was below the natural rate. Okay, and, and, and he did that in order to save the, the banking system. 
Uh, I could have painted the same scenario and said, this thing is unsustainable. Uh, we are creating an incredible explosion of credit. Uh, at some point, it's going to collapse. But when? But when? And, 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 and there was I, I wasn't able to count on, 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 for instance, on Greenspan doing what he did in 88. In the name of systemic risk, he reflated, right? Or just three months earlier, it was, it was tightening. Now, because the stock market collapsed, it reflated. Or what he did in, in, in during the Russian situation. If you're not an astute political analyst, you, you will miss it because you will keep on looking at the natural consequences of, doing, of, of what's happening and make decisions and make conclusions, arrive at conclusions that are not going to be realistic very often. So that, that's why I say that a good political analyst who understands how what, what, what's happening now in, in, in Washington and what the pressures are and, and uh, what the central banks are finally reacting to um, may be better in a way than, than a, an economic theorist. I, I would love to have that trade with I, I'm looking for I'm tr I'm looking for that desperately. My trading massage has been basic economic, basic economic, and and, and it's in, 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 in the bull market of the past three years. And I mean, I wrote a piece in in, in uh, what was it in uh, April of '97 uh, called "Fraying at the Edges," in which I, I basically laid out this scenario that starting from the outer corners of the periphery, uh, and, and, and that was the beginning, Thailand had not yet exploded, it was just about to, that the whole thing would catch on fire starting from the periphery because of credit. And I laid out the whole scenario. Now, it was stopped. It was stopped. We had a, what's called muddling through because you had the World Bank intervene and the Treasury intervene and they provided help to, to Indonesia and then to Korea and then to Thailand, the system was not allowed to fall. That was a political decision at the time. And, and, uh, and this continues. So during that period of time, if you were trading on the basis of economics, you weren't doing well. Hmm. That's, that's the best scenario. That would be the best scenario. If that can happen, you see, the problem is this, that the leverage in the system, the leverage in the, in the security system, is such that it won't allow, it may not allow the market to deflate slowly. Because you have a lot of derivatives, you have a lot of credit, and, uh, and it, it will be difficult for the market to, to, it will be difficult, I'm not saying it's not possible, it will be difficult for the market to deflate slowly. Uh, but uh, the Japanese example is interesting. If you don't, there's almost like a natural law. You either have very sharp corrections, and they're very short, or you have very long corrections and they're shallow, right? So you you have one of the two. For instance, the 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 um, the, the classic one that I remember because I was involved in trading and talking to the people in government was in Chile, uh, 1982. They 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 went to uh, they went to see where there was a tremendous boom, 78 to 82. Then suddenly there was a shortage of capital because of the Falkland Island problem, and Latin America was cut off from from capital. The boom came to a sudden end. The government refused to, to monetize. The economy went into a tailspin. GDP fell 21% from top to bottom. 21%. We're talking about half a percent moves. 21%. Unemployment went from 5 to 33% in, I think, less than a year. But it lasted only a year and a half. It went like this, like a V, and went back up. So if you allow it to liquidate, if it falls quickly and if it goes down... I don't want to use the expression, but if it hits the fan, uh, then it lasts a short period of time. But you get it over with. If you don't do it that way, you do the Japanese way, it's Chinese torture or Japanese torture. It's like 10 years. You, were, you had a question. That, sir. I was monetizing I, I, This gentleman was trying to before. That's okay? Okay. What is monetizing debt? Monetizing debt means that the government buys its own debt. It's central bank, one arm of the government, prints money to buy the fiscal, the fiscal debt, the treasury debt. And so it's one piece of printed paper in exchange for another piece of printed paper. And then you have a lot of notes circulating around. <laughs> Over there, in the back. Yeah, um, we've seen a tremendous, uh, Certainly react faster today. 
and they're certainly larger, the speculative funds are certainly larger in relation to resources of central banks, but they still end up uh, impacting, affecting the one variable that makes a lot of difference, which is the price of money. So, um, to answer your question, markets will react faster today, but, but I, I think that, that central banks can temporize, can temporize for a long time, and they can, they can forestall things for a while. Now, if inflation begins to take place, and which does after a while, then they, they themselves are defeated. That's, that's the theory of the vigilantes, the bond vigilantes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't fully subscribe to that because bond traders, if you, if you shake a bond trader, you know, shake them, you'll find that a bond trader is really trading bonds with a view to what the Fed will do. And so we have a game of, of uh, mutual influence. He's not there, we're not really trading bonds in a vacuum. It's like what the Fed will do next week or in two weeks from now, will he tighten when it won't tighten? And so the volatility is because of duration. You have a much, larger dura- a much longer duration asset. But, but the fact of the matter is that they only fluctuate on the basis of what the Fed is going to do. So I, I don't buy the argument that the bond market can do much. The bond market is guided. Yes? Yes, well, let me just read three questions in one if I may. Bit. Neither of the three. No, I, I think that what I'm trying to do is maybe try to acquire a little bit more, as I said before, political savvy, trying to read a little bit better the minds of some of these uh, people in terms of what is likely for them to be able to do politically. Like, I think that I detected a shift in Greenspan's June speech in which I think there's a shift there that he wants to bring the stock market down. Now. He won't accept this market going any higher, and he'll probably be happy if the market were to go down 20%. I assume that number, because their calculations are showing that the market is overpriced 20 or 25%. The tenor of the speech, the the references to the stock market, the many references to the stock market, makes me think that that's probably what he's talking about. So there's like a, I sense a certain political decision, a political will to bring the market down a little bit. Will he allow it to go down 30 or 40 percent or 50 or 60 or 70? I don't think so. Not in the first shot. And not unless he's forced by other events. So what was the first one? Okay, I'll, I'll repeat them. I'll repeat them. They're a good question. I just... Okay, on the dollar. Well, the first question is what, what is likely to bring down the dollar? His assumption is and it's probably not unreasonable to think that the dollar is uh, a little bit overvalued. Um, and what can bring it down? That's the question. And, and what's the catalyst? I, I, I think the, sto- the, the, the U.S. stock market is the key. I think that the U.S. stock market is uh, the symbol, practically, for U.S. strength and virility. And um, a breakdown in the stock market will probably cause capitalists to flow out. In other words, the U.S. is financing itself. The U.S. is spending more than it's making. That's a current account deficit. It's, it's getting larger. It's about three to four percent, three and a half to four percent of GDP. It's pretty large. How do they finance themselves? Well, they finance themselves by making a very attractive capital market. And so foreigners are buying Yahoo and they're buying Amazon and they're buying uh, everything else. So, I'm really that there's a confidence in the dollar itself. Well, the confidence in the dollar comes from the boom. It's, it's, it, it's not the dollar first and the boom second. It's the boom first, the dollar second. The boom. Sure. Because, no, they're holding dollars because the dollar is, is 70% of the world's trade is in dollars. That's the, every central bank in the world has to have a certain amount of dollars. And, and world trade is about 60-70% invoiced that way. So central, don't look at central banks, but look at individuals. Why do individuals hold dollars? The main reason is because it's, a, it's, the, most, it's the deepest capital market, the deepest money market, and the most attractive capital market and money market. It's where you make money. And when, when that stops... And when that stops, the dollars flow out. And the amount of dollars that flow out will not allow us to, will not allow the U.S. to finance its current account deficit, at which point the dollar begins to fall. So it, it, it's intimately related. And I believe that if you want to be short dollars, you probably have to first be short do- uh, stocks. And if... Oh, the, the, 
Yeah, but weakness is only relative. It's, it's, it's relative weakness because the U.S. economy has been the strongest and the most performing economy so far. Europe has been very, very weak, high unemployment, a lot of problems, labor problems. Uh, Japan has been in a, in a depression practically. So there is no economy that's, that is attractive enough. The most attractive economy in the world is the U.S., uh, has been the U.S., and this is why dollars come here. Now, what, what was your second um, my views on gold change quite radically in, in, in the last uh, two, two years, I think two, two and a half years, maybe a little bit more, when it became obvious to me that the central banks of the world had finally made a rational decision, rational in the sense of where they stood. They stood in a floating rate regime that does not need reserves, does not require reserves, doesn't require gold, doesn't require anything. You can have a central bank with no reserves, if it's a floating rate regime and if it's clean floating. So the decision that they made, which began with the decision made by Holland and then by Belgium and then Canada has been doing it for 15, 20 years, disposing of their gold. Then the Bank of England, Australia, Argentina, disposing of their gold. There's 12 to 15,000 tons of gold in central bank holdings. That's a lot of gold. It's about uh, maybe five, six, seven years worth of usage. So I began to realize that demonetization, the end of gold as being a monetary asset, would imply lower prices for some time until the process is ended. And, uh, and um, I don't see any good process for gold until, until, and this is very important, until we get all the central banks that want to sell get together and pool the gold together, maybe through the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, or the IMF, and auction it off over five years. At that point, the announcement will make the price of gold go down, but that will be the end of the bear market. So in, what, 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 is, what has got to happen, I think you've got to think in terms of production. Huh? Gold production continues to increase year after year. Even this past year, gold production increased, which is remarkable. Remarkable. The price has gone down 50% in the past two and a half years. And, 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 the, and the production continues to increase. Central bank selling will have to displace production. We'll have to displace it in order to be able to absorb that central bank selling. So we'll have to have production cuts of 20, 30, 40% to absorb that selling that's taking place. It's a lot of selling taking place. Yeah, but, but at lower prices, huh? at falling prices. If you want to, if you want to stop the falling prices, then you have to replace it completely. So at some point, you need to have production of gold go down from three and a half thousand tons a year, uh, from three thousand tons a year to maybe twelve hundred, fourteen hundred tons, and accommodate continuous central bank selling. So, what was your third question? You know, you're 100% right. I mean, what he's saying, I'm going to repeat it because it's, it's important. He, he's saying that, uh, that I made a statement that politics is very important at this point in time, but in, in the long run, economic theory will always will out. Like they say, value will out. Uh, and it's true. The problem is that we trade... Uh, timing is important for us. We may be right, but we're dead. Uh, so so uh, we have to time it better. And, 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 and ultimately, this, what happened the past five years, will end in disaster. There's absolutely no doubt. Whether we have a credit deflation or whether we have some acceleration of inflation, but this will end in disaster, what happened in the past five years. But when? And, and, and I don't want to be you know, short at the wrong time. I'll tell you something interesting. I I, uh, I heard, and I don't know if it's true, but I heard that most of the losses that took place in the Great Depression, investment losses, were not losses suffered in the first round. There were people who lost money because they thought prices were cheap over the subsequent four years. And that's where most of the losses took place. You know, maybe it's anecdotal, but it makes sense. I think that's the difference. That will be, there will be the difference between the political players and the ones who have some economic sense. 
The pure political players will look at the what's called the presidential cycle. They will look at things of that sort. They will say, well, there's been a will now, some political will, to bring down the bubble. And then when the bubble goes down and deflates a little bit, they'll jump back in and say, that's it, it's over. And, but if you understand the process, and uh, you may be able to survive a lot longer. So it, it, economics is very important. You have to marry it. right? So when you say the political analysts are very, very good, if they have the proper economic background to them. There were a number of changes in the in the um, in this in the seventies in the latter part of the seventies. The Fed went monetarist, which was uh, um, had decided that the best thing to do was to follow Milton Friedman and just to look at and regulate the growth of money supply. By the very late seventies, inflation had gotten out of hand, and then Paul Volcker. Um, and I think today, if I look back at that time, I didn't realize how courageous he was. But he he uh, he applied the brakes and he managed by way of, I think he managed by way of reserves, excess reserves in the system. But whatever the case is, he he um, uh, provided much less reserves to the system. There was a crunch and interest rates, if you remember, went up to 20 percent. They gave up monetarism in, in 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 almost after that, two three years later, they gave up monetarism because they found very little uh, correlation between the measures of money supply that they were looking at and economic activity and inflation. They gave it up. And the, the, the Greenspan years are years of pure discretion. There's nothing that they look at in specific. Pure discretion. Just you look at the economy, you smell it. It's good. You keep it the way it is. It smells a little bad. You just raise the rates. You know, that kind of thing. It's pure discretion. So we have had no real monetary policy in systematic terms, past uh, past uh, 86, maybe 85, 86. Please. Which monetary system would be better? I tell you, it's hard to judge it independently because uh, w- one group draws on another group. For instance, the, the Volcker experiment, what Volcker did by, by basically saying that he will end inflation, and raising interest rates to 20% and, and then bringing on the, the depression of 82, he, he, got, he created a tremendous amount of credibility for the Fed at that point. The Fed had shown that it will not allow inflation. Now, Greenspan has drawn on that credibility for many years, so it's hard to say whether his system is any better. I mean, what he's done, he's benefited from the extraordinary credibility that the Fed gained at that point. So I, I can't decide. It, uh, yeah. It's probably true that we, we have some of that moral outrage, uh, and that and that it influences you. Sure, probably true, and uh, doesn't allow you to participate in a bull market that you think is made out of built on sand. It's probably true. So it's not just deciding. Well, I have to look for the policy. Oh, no, no, no. When I say I have to look for the politics, is I got to look for the politics to tell me when the music stops. Not to participate. I wouldn't go along with it, I, but I would want to know when it stops. I want to know when that will, that political will has changed. That, that's what I mean. I just wouldn't be short until, until such time as I get an idea that... You, you wanted to ask me something before. Two possibilities of a short, sharp drop. Um, well, you have the Japanese example. Uh, they, almost all the banks have survived if, if, it's, if it's long enough. Of course, the taxpayers will pay. Yeah. Um, if it's short and sharp, uh, I'd say that most financial institutions will fail. Most of the large ones will fail. And... Um, I don't know which way it's going to go because I, I, I don't know that I don't know the politics behind that either. But I would imagine that the powers to be don't want the big banks to fail, the big investment banks to fail either. Just getting back to gold for a second. Um, some people would argue that the price of gold is determined by the market. Well, you know, you, the, the, gold, the, the question, the gold question, is both a relative and an absolute question. Um, I would say that. Um, given what I've mentioned before, the demonetization process, that gold will either fall in absolute terms 
or at least fall in relative terms. So in your scenario, if we had a reacceleration of inflation and, and commodity prices were going up, you shouldn't be betting on gold. You should be buying live cattle or pork bellies or silver or something because gold will be depressed by its relative supply problem. So, you know, it's, it's true, by the way, that markets have bought, from an investment point of view, there's much less buying of gold. Market, markets have bought the, the, the idea of low inflation and, and financial assets that compensate you for it. But what you, you can do very much better than the uh, tips, that these, these treasury index linked securities, these inflation index linked securities, they pay you 4% a year, indexed to the, the rate of inflation. That's pretty good. But uh, the amount of the jewelry demand is tremendous. Uh, we, are, we, are absorbing, we are absorbing enormous amounts of producers selling and government selling. It's, it's tremendous. I agree. It, investment buying is not strong. Investment buying is not strong. What's strong is jewelry, fabrication demand. Yeah, no, no. no I, I made a point about investment because I think he was talking about a demand for money, for gold as, as money or as fear in case of another inflation. The investment demand is dead. But the jewelry demand is very strong and it's going to absorb all the supply, but it's going to take time. You're going to have to sell all that gold. Um, almost every stock market crash has been the price of It's flawed a little bit too. One of the reasons we, have a, we had inverted yield curves is because we also had regulation. Uh, you remember that regulation, was the regulation Q? Or? Q, right? that didn't allow savings accounts to go over a certain ceiling. So some of it was translated into an inverted yield curve. Um, I wouldn't hang my hat on that alone. I would say this, it's possible to have a very large decline without an inverted yield curve. But surely, if you get an inverted yield curve, and we're close, huh? You know this, we are close. Um, surely if you get an inverted yield curve, you, you better get out. I'm not sure that that's the Austrian view. I think that that's the popular view, and it may not be wrong that that uh, imports are maintaining a a uh, sort of a damper on prices, and you can see that because your current account deficit is getting larger, your trade deficit gets larger and larger, so it's maintaining some kind of a uh, damper, right? But um, it, it will start working the other way when the dollar. This is the sequence, and I was started mentioning it to him. The sequence is the stock market comes down, the dollar goes down. When the dollar goes down, the price inflation goes up. So inflation will follow because we have repressed inflation with a very strong dollar. So as the dollar goes down, the inflation will come out of the system. And instead of 2% inflation, you may have 4 or 5% inflation. What would that look like in terms of deflation? about deflation and prices, by the way? There is no such a thing in our system. You'll never have deflation but you will have credit deflation. That's different. You cannot get price deflation. That's something very important. You see that in the press. You read it every day. A lot of people talk about it. They say Japan has a deflation. Truth is, Japan doesn't have a deflation. The CPI is basically at zero. It's credit deflation, yeah. So how would that impact us? How would that be uh, very bad? It could be very bad. I mean, you, you can have uh, business failures. I mean, huge business failures, unemployment rising. I, I don't need to paint uh, the picture. I mean, it could be really bad. Go back to 74. See what happened in 74. In 74, you had a very classic. Uh, you had an inflation and then uh, uh, an end to that period. And the, the, the recession of 74 was very severe. Unemployment rose above 10%. Why can't we get general inflation? Because money supply doesn't really go down. It, it, you, you, the only other time that you ever had deflation, price deflation was in the 30s. And that's because the money supply was cut by a third. If money supply doesn't change, then you can get asset deflation, asset deflation, houses, stock prices, but, but uh, the, 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 the car fare, the room in the hotel, the things of that sort will not change very much. You're not going to get uh, real, real deflation. Deflation and inflation are monetary phenomena. If, if, if there's no change in money supply, then you're not going to get it. In fact, if the Fed hadn't inflated for the past 10 years, chances are that we would have had a, a deflation of prices of 3-4% a year.
because productivity has been very strong, very high, and we would have had a wonderful, wonderful situation. People who lent money uh, would have gotten back more than what they lent. Right? The lenders would have been in great shape. The borrowers, not so good, but the lenders would be in great shape from the lender's point of view. If the Fed would not, have, would not have inflated money, you would have had price deflation. Yeah. Yeah. But have you seen changes in the consumer price in it? It's still above zero. You've had disinflation, but not deflation. It's 2%, one and a half, two, two and a half. Doesn't happen. Forget about deflation. You can bet hair will grow here when you have deflation in the Western, in the Western economies. And that's why you can bet on inflation. You can actually bet intelligently on inflation. I would never buy a 30-year government bond, but maybe I would buy those index-linked bonds, you know, because I'm guaranteed that I will not lose money because of inflation. Of course, taxes are a problem. They tax the inflation gain. That's, that's... 